It's time now to answer some of your business questions. So let's get our board of directors in here to help us out. Slava Rubin is the founder and CEO of Indiegogo, the largest crowdfunding site. And Tanya Yuki is the founder and CEO of Shareably, a provider of social content analytics for businesses. Thanks so much for being here, you guys. Great to be here. Good to see you guys. Okay, let's go to the first question. It is about access to capital. I know some people that have had a lot of success with this crowdfunding stuff, and I would love to hear more about it, the do's and don'ts, the pros and cons, the strategies about what's going on with all this and the opportunity with the crowdfunding. Well, Slava, obviously this question is directed right towards you. Uh, the crowdfunding. Well, definitely crowdfunding and using Indiegogo is a great alternative to being able to get access to capital versus any other methods. There's really an entire book that we could discuss right now of do's and don'ts and other things. But I would say, number one, you want to have a good pitch. You want to be able to create a video and ha that way you can raise up to 114% more money on average than not having a video as part of your pitch. Number two is you want to be proactive. You want to get updates out there. Have an update every five days or less. You'll raise four times more money if you do an every update every five days or less versus every 20 days or more. Mm. And number three, you want to find an audience that cares. Don't expect just if you build it, they will come. You need to have your friends, your family, your fans, your customers to start funding you first. Get that snowball rolling and then you can keep moving forward. In terms of the don'ts, don't expect just to put it up there, walk away and hope, you know, elves will come with bags of money because there's work that put, you have to put into it. The more work you put into it, the more work, the more results you'll get out of it. I, I think that is the best point of all, right? It, you need a network, you need a, a base of people to get it out to so that they can share it with people as well. Absolutely, but people shouldn't be intimidated to think that they need to have thousands and thousands of Twitter followers. I mean, everybody has an email list, everybody has friends and family. Right. Start with that and then get the ball rolling. We'll help amplify it so you can raise more money than you ever could on your own. And Tanya, I think uh, a lot of times when people think of crowdfunding they're still confused what crowdfunding is and so can you give a little insight well I, that's a wonderful question because there's two types of crowdfunding because sometimes people are thinking about it in the context of a cause or nonprofit and other times it's really to get your business going so I'd make that distinction between rewards based and equity based crowdfunding if it's rewards based then absolutely you've got to get your incentives set up and if you want to do it as an equity based thing to actually fund a business then you need to make sure that all of those structures are set up correctly before so you're giving away an appropriate part of your business and I just want to echo what you said about social proof uh, people do ignore their first level networks we see across social media so many wonderful business ideas and great entrepreneurs fail because they haven't mobilized the people who are basically obligated to help them because they're friends or family to really create that momentum and that social proof that makes everyone else want to go me too Right. I, I think that's a great point. For some people, it's so natural to go to those people and get them to help, and other people feel like, oh, it's a burden if I'm asking my friends and my family. I want to do it on my own. Right. Well, and you have to remember, they want to help you, right? They want to see you succeed. They love you. One of the best things you can do is just put out that ask. Too often, you're not being clear about, hey, I'm looking to raise $10,000, and can you put in 100 bucks to make this bakery happen? Just doing that ask is, I would say, 80% of the job. Right. Okay. This next question is about franchising. In terms of franchising, what are the top three characteristics we should look for when we're selecting franchise brand partners? Great question. Any ideas? If I were going to pick the top three, I'd say culture fit, culture fit, and culture mm. fit. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, of course they have to have the capital, of course they have to have the skills, but bringing on franchise brand partners is no different to recruiting key members of your own team. Do they share your vision? Are they going to really uphold the values of your business? Because you're only ever going to be as good as your weakest link. And if just one franchisee takes the business in a different direction, then it's really going to hurt. It's going to poison the whole well for everyone. It seems important also, Slava, to start small, right? Don't just go out there and start franchising. Maybe start with one that's close by who you can work with really carefully. Yeah, I think anything you should always start with a pilot and be able to test, get the feedback. Speaking about feedback, I think one of the most important things when looking for partners is really reference checks to understand mm -hmm. what is the feedback people are getting on this person or on the other side, if you want to talk about the franchisor, you know, what's the reference checks on how people are doing working with them. Also, I think you need to have the passion. It's important just because somebody wants to be an entrepreneur, if they really have, you know, uh, plumbing in their background, maybe they're not the right person for that bakery franchise. So it's not just to be able to get into the business. I think you need to be passionate about that specific area, which goes back to culture fit. Okay. One thing I'll throw in, and maybe they won't want to hear this, but 
if something isn't working in terms of the systems or some of your franchise partners, the problem could always be on the other end of the leash. You have to set up your systems and your procedures so clearly yep. that you don't leave the room for people to have to improvise and have to second guess what you would do if you were in their shoes. Which gets to that point again of start small. Yep. Work out all the kinks before you make this a big deal. Okay, let's go to the last question. It's about leveling the playing field for men and women. How do we continue to move women business owners forward so that we can equal parity to our male counterparts? Currently, there's lots of resources out there that just throw the name women in front of it and stand as being the only resource for women. So, Tanya, you and I have had this conversation a lot. What, what are your thoughts on it? It really comes down to how you approach that question, and I'm going to flip that question on its head. I don't think the point is to bring women-owned businesses up to their male counterparts. It's to really help women-owned businesses connect the dots. And the biggest gap that I see, and what I went through uh, when I was raising venture capital for my company, Shareably, is just understanding what the access to capital looks like and what every different type of investor is going to want. Because if you're on your own as a woman-owned business and you're self-funded and you're struggling, it's really hard to think about the expansion capital to get you to the next level. And that's really the thing that's going to help a lot of businesses transform. Do you think that's harder for women-owned businesses than, than male-owned businesses? I think it's... I think it's perceived to be harder for women-owned businesses than male-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. If you want my personal opinion, I think you take gender out of the equation when you're fundraising because it comes down to, is the business good? Do you understand it? Are you credible? And are they going to fund this company? I don't think you should be thinking about how it's different as a woman, but the statistics are out there that prove that women do get less venture capital um, and they do have fewer funded businesses, but I think it's all about shedding light on how to do it and on the women who are successfully doing it so that others who want to go out and replicate that have a model for success. And you have an interesting perspective, Slava, I, I would guess, because you have a very strong female co-founder. Yeah, so Danae is my co-founder along with Eric, but on Indiegogo, actually, you, you, know, you bring up these metrics about VC funding. I think it's like 10% or less actually goes to women-led companies, and they have the gatekeepers there, the VCs. On Indiegogo as an open platform, 50% of the money, nearly 50%, is all going to women. So it's really interesting if you have an open platform and you eliminate some of that bias. I think the way to have that be consistently growing and evolving into the world is really er at an earlier age, empowerment to not really think about what you're saying, men versus women, you know, take out the gender. And it really should be everybody being taught to take risks, becoming entrepreneurs, you know, learning what they need to learn. And, you know, moving forward is just based on a good product and a good business. Yeah, it's interesting. And a platform like yours allows someone to get that seed funding to prove that there's a concept. Then you get the education around what you should be doing to pitch angels and venture capitalists. Then you've got the whole package. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. It was a really great conversation and so good to see you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me.